All right, it's the big show. There's nothing more important in American government and politics than the U.S. Constitution. And in this jumbo-sized presentation, we look at the birth of the Constitution and the formation of the government we'll be studying all year long. Probably the first thing that we need to do is frame the Constitution in its historical context. Three of the questions that we'll look at uh, the, are the three that are on the screen for you right now. Who was there, with what goals, and by what authority? That last question is a particularly interesting one to me. Authority being the right to use power. What right did this room of 73 white guys have to create a new government for the United States? I mean, if any group of 73 people today tried to craft a new government, we'd look at them as separatists or worse, and yet in this case we venerate their actions. And the authority was a little bit murky. The Philadelphia Convention was called for at the Annapolis Convention, a meeting that only five states, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Virginia, attended. And while the delegates were sent by their state legislatures, they were sent only with the task to revise the existing Articles of Confederation, not to rewrite the entire government. If an agent defies the orders of their principal, if the delegate ignores the will of the entity that gave it power, can it still rightly use power? Despite the fact that Alexander Hamilton will tell us that the very notion is laughable in the Federalist Papers when he's writing about the courts, clearly in this case the framers felt as though they did have the right to remake the government. And part of that stems from what came out of Philadelphia was not the new government itself, but a proposal for the new government, a topic that we'll touch on in the next show when we get into the ratification debates. So the framers weren't quite throwing a coup here. They still needed to get this signed off on by the states who had delegated them the power in the first place. Although it is worth noting that the law of the land, the Articles of Confederation, declared that any amendments to the government needed to be made unanimously. Well, the Constitutional Convention was far from meeting that threshold of unanimous proclamation, and we will talk about that throughout this presentation. But that's all part of the context. The degree to which the Constitutional Convention was a potentially extra-legal coup can be tied to the fact that there really was no realistic, legitimate way to amend the existing Articles of Confederation government. And with Shays' rebellion waking people up to the real dangers of not having central authority, there was a sense of urgency behind this one. After all, how else do we explain the fact that 12 states attended the Philadelphia Convention after Madison's only got five, state, five states to attend in Annapolis? That third question is a murky one. Let's move on to a little bit more of a concrete one, that first question. Who was there? Well, let's take a look at the framers of the Constitution. Well, let's take a look at the framers of the Constitution. Who was at the Constitutional Convention? The 73 white dudes. This should be no surprise to us given our grasp of colonial politics and our own history, but there are some interesting things to be noted about the attendees. First of all, of the 73 appointees, only 55 actually attended the Constitutional Convention, and of those 55, only 30 were regularly present and involved in the meeting with, and with many of them coming and going over the course of the four-month convention. So we're dealing with a fairly small group, although we're also dealing with a little bit of a younger group than we might expect. While we tend to conflate all the figures of the 18th century together as being this monolithic entity of the Founding Fathers, we're dealing with different bodies at the time of the Constitution than we were at the Declaration. Only eight overlapping signatures are on both the Constitution and the Declaration. There's been a bit of a changing of the guard already. Seven of the men there had served as governors before. Whether this is a surprisingly high degree of experience or a surprisingly inexperienced group is open to interpretation, but there that is. 39 of them had served in Congress at some point during the Articles government, so there's a familiarity with the faults of that system. But also there's a sense that we're dealing with a political elite here. 
After all, if you're appointed repeatedly by the state legislature to represent them, the odds are that you're in some way representative of the interests of the wealthy in that state. 34 of the framers, 34 of those present at the Constitutional Convention, were lawyers by trade, which should draw an interesting connection to our mind. When your textbook speaks of the signers of the Declaration, it's quick to point out that they were not political theorists or political scholars, but rather just citizens who had an economic interest in independence. Well, the Constitution's a different story. This is a room full of lawyers, a room full of political theorists. It's possible to make the case, as indeed half of you will in class, that this group was high-minded and dealing with notions of liberty and justice rather than simply trying to make sure that there was a government that was strong enough to protect their wealth from rebellious yokels out in the western parts of the states. But the second thing is possible too. We'll fight about it. Only one-third of the framers served in the Revolutionary War. In some cases this is because they were too young to have served effectively, and in other cases it's because they were wealthy enough that they were able to pay someone else to serve in their stead, but one-third of them served. That's always insane to me when we think about our elementary school picture of the time period of this being a, de a generation that just signed the declaration together, kicked some redcoats out of the country, and then built the greatest government of all time. Really, that's about three different groups that we're talking about for the most part there. The list also is notable for who wasn't there. John Hancock, President of the Continental Congress at the time of the Revolution, wasn't there. He did come to support the document, the U.S. Constitution, but he didn't create it. Neither of the Adamses was present, Jefferson was overseas at the time, and the pride and joy of Ashland, Virginia, Patrick Henry refused to attend, stating that he smelled a rat in Philadelphia, and that what the framers were going to do was tantamount to treason and the establishment of an American tyranny. The idea that the Founding Fathers were Founding Brothers who cooperated and shared a common vision, yeah, that's bunk. That's a fairy tale that we concocted to make ourselves feel good about the time period. Many of the framers don't have a hand in several things that we associate them with, and they certainly did not agree when they did. Most notable in our absence, though, the entire godforsaken state of Rhode Island and Providence plantations was absent from the Constitutional Convention. Leaving aside how I feel about Rhode Island, the rules said that amending the Articles required unanimous consent from all 13 states. That's hard to get when you only have 12 of the 13 players at the table there. Alright, yeah, let's blow them all up. Please review this note slide, which you can download from the video description. By now, I'm going to assume that you're familiar with the so-called Great Compromise or Connecticut Compromise. It's covered in the text, you went over it last year with Mr. Lekovich, you probably went over it some with Mr. Field or someone else in 7th grade. We should know the basic story. What I'm here to do is add a layer of nuance to it. See, the usual narrative goes that the Virginia plan called for a one-house legislature and, based on population, and the New Jersey plan called for a one-house legislature that would be uniform in its representation. And then Big Daddy Roger Sherman comes along and just says, hey, por que no los dos? And it just completely blows everyone's mind. Madison has to compare it to a tea saucer when explaining it to Jefferson, just so TJ's little pea brain could understand it. It's important that we realize that that part of the compromise is not at all revolutionary. It's important that we realize that the bicameral legislature was by no means new. Check out the Virginia plan itself. Madison was calling for a bicameral legislature before the convention even started. It's just that he wanted both houses to be proportional. The only thing different about the compromise plan was that it called for one of each, which isn't really so much crafting a compromise as it is admitting that you're not getting anywhere in the argument. Also, I'll remind you that the states are only 12 years removed from the British system at this time, which is a bicameral legislature. 
we invented bicameral legislatures in the same way that we discovered this continent by winning a war with someone else and then pretending that they never existed. However, there are three other items of note that I want to point, uh, to point to in here, and two of them are about the New Jersey Plan, which we often look at as being part of the uh, ash heap of history, but there's a couple important things to look at in the New Jersey Plan here. And the first one is New Jersey's, New, the New Jersey Plan's executive branch. One year, no re-election. Sound familiar? They're taking a page out of Pennsylvania's playbook there. The goal being to create a chief executive who is going to be weak in comparison to the legislature. If you can't get reelected and only serve one year, you're not going to have a very ambitious agenda. You won't be able to accomplish a lot of the things that you want. You will need to defer to a legislature who otherwise would just be able to wait you out if you tried to do anything without their permission. Obviously, this is not the system that we got with the president being a relatively powerful leader, at least in the modern era, although legislative supremacy was a reality of our government for 100 plus years. We'll go over that when we look at the history of Congress and the executive in a few chapters. However, right now, take a look below that. Mr. Patterson did shape our government in some way. He planned for, he, his plan called for judges to be appointed for life something that we did get in the final text of the U.S. Constitution. So there are elements of compromise across the plan. It's not just that simple story of the bicameral legislature. Thirdly, though, let's take a look at the Virginia Plan's executive. Mr. Madison, father of the Constitution, didn't originally call for the president to be elected by the people. He called for an executive to be elected instead by both houses of Congress. What was Madison looking for? He was looking for a prime minister. We often lead ourselves astray if we assume that the convention was a pair of compromises with the three-fifths compromise, the great compromise, and then we're done here. There were a number of people, important people, in that room that were floating ideas that were radically different than what we have today. Every time that we say that the Constitution reflects the views of the Founding Fathers, a historian should roll over in their grave. The Constitution represents their consensus, sure, but there's so much more nuance, individuality, and unexplored other systems that were in there. And this isn't just idle musings. These were passionate dudes fighting about ideas that they cared about, and it looked very often like all was lost. In fact, take our boy Benjamin Franklin here, who, in week five of the convention, got up on the floor and suggested that they ask God to help them. The guy who they had to, had to use a buddy system with just to make sure that he didn't go blabbing secrets to large women when he got drunk at night, yeah, he's the guy getting out on the floor and suggesting that they pray or else all is lost. It's probably also worth noting that the convention only didn't end up doing this because they didn't have the money to, in the budget to pay for a minister. If you want to really know the Constitutional Convention, you're going to need to be prepared for contradiction. They were elites who were forced to suffer in a sweltering meeting room for a summer and couldn't afford a minister. They fought hard for the ratification of the Constitution, but when it came time to actually write it, they hired an unknown scribe to do the job because no one wanted to be the guy who actually inked the darn thing. The Federalist Papers insisted that the process wasn't a coup, but they required that the whole thing be done in secret lest word get out that they'd taken upon themselves to scrap the existing government. She's a slippery beast to wrap your arms around, that Constitution is. But the Constitution cannot possibly be understood by strictly looking at her words and not at the context that brought about those words. Lastly, a question about the intention of the framers. In class, you'll be having it out over whether or not different economic groups benefited from the revolution. Well, I want to take a look at another textbook, James Wilson's American Government. We've mentioned it many times in the videos already. I want to take a look at this other textbook's analysis related to a related but completely different question. Were women left out of the Constitution? 
We've already established that there was nary a woman at the convention, so in that sense, automatically yes, but Abigail Adams did implore and actually directly threaten outright rebellion against her husband should he not remember the ladies. To some extent, though, the Constitution left some doors open for women. We'll take a look at it many times in class, and almost nowhere does it refer to gender. Most positions are referred to, even in the original test, test, text of the Constitution, by their title, without any use of pronoun, with the most notable exception being uh, the presidency, which does get a few he's thrown in there, but those make the use of person or citizens elsewhere seem so much more deliberate, especially in the Privileges and Immunities Clause guaranteeing that the same privileges across states will exist for citizens in general, not specifically men. Women folk have rights too. Not exactly progressive for our modern era, but hey, this is not nothing that we're looking at here. At the same time, though, we can't really look at the Constitution as being pro-women. Women don't get any ink in the Constitution until the 19th Amendment in the 20th century. Furthermore, the Constitution was very clear that it was states who decided who got to vote in national elections. And at this time, no state was even close to allowing women to vote, and no state would be until 1869 when Wyoming did it just so they could get enough citizens to become a state. The Constitution isn't a document of gender equality in its time, it's one of continuing the status quo. Was it revolutionary in other ways? Well, I hope you'll convince me of that in class coming up. That's all for this video. Sparty rules, down with the patriarchy, and be excellent to each other.